Attack frameworks are methods to visualize how attackers go about their cyber attacks. There are ways in which we can deconstruct the thought process, the techniques, and the tactics used by an adversary, used by maybe a hacking group or uh, the individual hacker to perform a hack or attack on our system or on the assets that we're trying to defend. So in a cybersecurity sense, attack frameworks can help us visualize and predict threats to our organization. And by modeling these threats, we can understand how to protect against them. There are several attack frameworks that we might use. One of them is the MITRE attack framework. It's the MITRE ATT and CK, which is usually just uh, pronounced as attack. It has 14 different techniques, and we can see those techniques here, starting from reconnaissance all the way to impact. Now, reconnaissance, uh, what we start here, this is a pretty complex model, as you can see. And what we're doing here with each of these techniques and the sub-techniques is we're understanding the methodology, the, the, the techniques or the, uh, the strategies, the tactics used by the adversaries to perform their exploit. So I just describe an example attack. Say we have an attacker uh, trying to compromise a web application that we have that hosts an online store. So first the attacker might download that web application as a user, uh, perform open source reconnaissance on the company, try and find examples of people who work at the company, uh, maybe engineers or people through things like LinkedIn or through public records through the company website, try and find examples of people who work there, okay? And they would develop their research, they would um, develop their capabilities, they would gather the information they need from the reconnaissance phase and use that to start to frame how they're going to perform their initial attack, their initial access. And they may do this through maybe a phishing attack, okay? So perhaps, you know, they want to have uh, initial access through uh, maybe a phishing message to one of those people that they identified through LinkedIn or through a public website who works at the company and has access to the application. Maybe they, through a phishing email, they infect that, that employee's machine. And then from there, they can gain initial access into the web application. Maybe they can execute from there some scripts. From here, they can, they're choosing what type of uh, exploit or what the language of the exploit that they need to, like the coding language they need to use to make this exploit work. And once they've done that initial access, they want to establish some sort of backdoor or persistence so they can continually access the network or the resource. So perhaps they create their own account within the web application or they establish a backdoor that allows them to log on or allows them to uh, access the web application in a covert manner. From there, they may choose to do privilege escalation. And these steps here are somewhat done, I'd say, in the same uh, phase. I know it's, it goes from left to right, but there are certain phases like these two, I think you can group together. And then these, most of the time you can group together pretty well. They may occur out of order and that's okay. That's, it's not strictly within order from left to right. So it's good to understand. And if you go on the MITRE ATT&CK website, you can look at each of these sub techniques and get more information about each of those see examples of those sub techniques. So this is used as a resource. It's not just the list here. So going back to our example, once the attackers establish persistence, they might elevate their privileges. They might uh, increase the privileges of the account that they created initially. And of course, the whole time they're gonna try and gain access to any credentials there on the network. They're trying to invade defenses like web application firewalls, uh, vulnerability scanners, things like that. They may discover more information within that web application or within the network. And then they may choose to do some lateral movement to find some other pieces of information, or maybe they see something that's a, a little more valuable. So they'll pivot and they'll do lateral movement to uh, find that or start exploiting that information instead. In the collection phase, they're gonna be downloading information 
uh, finding or discovering more information in here. And you can look at these with each of the sub techniques. And of course, if they want to execute any future malware, they want to establish some sort of command and control where they're able to execute commands within the network or within the system, within the web application, and have those being executed uh, either remotely or maybe set on a timer like with a logic bomb. Then the attacker would want to exfiltrate and want to close that back door, uh, take any data that they want to uh, download from the network and exfiltrate that, download that offline. Maybe they want to do some sort of ransomware attack with a double extortion. So they'll download the data from the network or from a database. And then afterwards, they'll uh, execute that ransomware malware on the network to then uh, shut down that web application and hold that company for ransom, the developers of web application. So that'd be the impact phase. So pretty complex and we can get into different details, uh, but we don't need to do that to just get an understanding of the MITRE attack framework. And that's it visualized there. So there's lots of different sub techniques. Each of these would be a technique. And then you see different sub techniques like discovery has 25 different techniques under it. So very useful, but pretty complex. Some, some organizations might not want to go this in depth. Maybe they're trying to analyze an attack that's occurred on their network or on their system. So they may choose something a little simpler, maybe like the diamond model of intrusion analysis. Now the diamond model of intrusion analysis was initially developed for the intelligence community, as in the like a national intelligence community, military intelligence or state intelligence. And every event uh, is really looked at through this diamond model. So it's the core value, the core component of the diamond model intrusion analysis is a specific event. So from that event, we would need to analyze who the victim was, who the adversary was, the capabilities of the adversary, and the infrastructure that was used or exploited during the attack. Now, some of these might be unknowns for us, okay? We might have understanding of the capabilities and we understand our infrastructure, the victim's infrastructure, but we may not understand the adversary or we may not know who the adversary is. So we can make educated guesses and we can analyze based on the capabilities and infrastructure of the victim who the adversary may be. So for example, say we, let's use a ransomware example. We're hit with ransomware and it's it brings up a blue screen saying us that we need to contact uh, the attacker, pay in Bitcoin or else all of our data would be encrypted and we'd be unable to access that, access that information. Maybe we're a small government, a local government, water treatment facility. So our infrastructure is an industrial control system, a water treatment facility. The capability adversary is a ransomware attack using some parameters, maybe the look and feel of the ransomware attack, we can understand that. Based on that, we can kind of get a sense of what type of ransomware was being used against us. And we know that we are the victim. So from that, we could piece together and gain clues about the adversary. So what adversaries like to target local governments, like to target industrial control systems, water treatment plants for specifically what types of ransomware looks like the ransomware that we're being affected with. Uh, now this, so from that, we can get a list of maybe advanced persistent threats that commonly use these types of capabilities and target our infrastructure so that we can get a sense of who the adversaries are. Now, of course, this type of analysis is gonna happen after the fact, after an incident happens to kind of understand more about the nature of the attack. The local government that got hit with the ransomware would have more immediate concerns when they're targeted by the ransomware than trying to figure out who the adversary is right away. So this is usually an investigation that's done afterwards. And it comes from the intelligence community where the intelligence community would try and figure out, you know, say there was a terrorist bombing from the nature of the bomb, you know, who were the victims, maybe the bomb targeted a hospital or something terrible. Uh, the capabilities of the adversary had a certain type of bomb, maybe it was a pipe bomb and the infrastructure 
of the victim was at hospital. Uh, so maybe, you know, it was a certain religious group or a certain political group that was targeted. From that, you can gain a sense of who maybe the adversary would be. So that's where the diamond model of truth and analysis comes from. It comes from that intelligence community. And that's where a lot of these, you'll see a lot of military terminology um, in these threat models because a lot of them are derived either from the military, from military applications, or from the intelligence community applications where their, their threats are more life-threatening than what we see in cybersecurity. Of course, in cybersecurity, some cyber attacks can lead to direct loss of life or threats to life, but a lot of times in cybersecurity, we're somewhat removed from that danger. So the terminology may seem a little more aggressive than what you might be used to in other aspects of cyber. Now, another one, this is one that highlights that point I just mentioned, is the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. Sounds pretty aggressive. And that's because it was derived from the term kill chain, which is a military concept. It's a concept used to analyze the structure of an attack or how an attack would occur. So, you know, say we have a military unit advancing into a, uh, a city, okay? How are they going to do that? You know, what, what's the logistics look like? How is, uh, what areas are they attacking from? Is there gonna be an airborne component? Is there, they're gonna be uh, ground troops on vehicles or on foot? So that's where you have this aggressive terminology coming into the play with the cyber kill chain. So the cyber kill chain has seven phases. So we think about it from a military standpoint, we come back now to the cyber standpoint, we're thinking about how a cybersecurity attacking group or APT or maybe just a solo hacker, it doesn't matter what type of group, it could be a hacktivist, could be a script kitty, could be an APT, could be a criminal organization. But first, the step would be to perform some sort of reconnaissance, reconnaissance on the network or on the company that they're targeting. Then they would develop some sort of payload, some sort of weaponization. Uh, they would choose what type of payload that would work best, depending on that organization. And then they would deliver that. You know, maybe they would deliver that uh, through a PDF attachment, or maybe they would drop some USBs with some malware on them in the parking lot of the target building. Or, you know, there's a company headquarters, you drop some USBs with some malware on them in the parking lot, people say, oh, I wonder who dropped their USB. They pick up the USB, they go to their work computer, they plug it in to see who it belonged to. Maybe there's a PDF on there and that PDF has some malware or there's some malware that runs when the, P when the USB is plugged into the computer. It can be a pretty effective way of getting someone to infect their system with malware. And then they'd have the exploitation, that malware that runs off that USB stick onto the network Maybe we put a worm on there and then that worm starts to self-propagate throughout the network. The installation occurs usually around the same time as the exploitation. Uh, and then we'd have command and control where we're establishing that, that backdoor, that means of tapping into the network or controlling, uh, sending commands to our malware or to our devices on the network to then either exfiltrate data or you know, download data, corrupt data, install ransomware, uh, do cyber intelligence, maybe we're trying to do espionage, corporate espionage, uh, steal intellectual property, whatever we need to do. And then we'd perform exfiltration as attack, we'd cover our tracks, we'd delete or change, modify audit logs to ensure that we, our presence isn't detected. We would uh, make sure that we're leaving no trail of our activities there. So again, this was developed by Lockheed Martin and it's used as a really big marketing push with Lockheed Martin. Now, if we take a look at Lockheed Martin's website, uh, we see the cyber kill chain right here. So this is Lockheed Martin, the cyber kill chain, they have APT at the top and then they have the seven steps here. So. Very good marketing material for Lockheed Martin, and it's just a good way, 
oftentimes you can see it's kind of a dumbed down version of the MITRE ATT&CK framework. We still see those same steps reflected here in MITRE ATT&CK, but we see a lot more. See about double. Um, so still a very useful ATT&CK framework. I think this one is probably one you should be the most familiar with. Memorize the steps of this framework. It's very useful to visualize and understand how attackers go about their threats. And that's the point of these attack frameworks is to get into the mindset or understand how attackers are thinking about performing their attacks so that we as cybersecurity professionals can defend against them.